you have to create architecture in cities that are uplifting and great art and and one can imagine it being a future kind of a strategy. Business of Architecture, episode 337. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable architecture practice. This podcast is a production of Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy that has helped over 103 architecture firm owners grow and improve their practices. Today's show is also sponsored by Layer App, the flexible database for architects that makes it easy to view and share photos, files, and project data right in Revit. Get a completely free 14-day trial to go check it out by visiting layer.team forward slash B-O-A. That's layer, L-A-Y-E-R, Dot team T E A M forward slash B O A. Today we speak with famed architect Lorcan O'Herlihy and Richard Loring, a renowned developer from the Los Angeles area. Richard Loring is the director of design and construction for Domos. He's an award winning developer with a long standing history of working with many of the most forward thinking architecture firms. After receiving his master's in the history of English architecture at Cambridge University, Loring founded Archetype, a general contracting company where he built many noteworthy contemporary buildings for 26 years. Loring then served as managing director for Habitat Group, Los Angeles, developing contemporary multifamily projects throughout the city. Many of Loring's Habitat Group projects won AIA awards at the local, state, and national level in addition to garnering coverage in leading architecture and design publications such as the New York Times Dwell and Architectural Record. Today, Loring is leading the latest Los Angeles Domos project in Hancock Park. In partnership with Lorcan O'Herlihy Architects, Domos plans to reconfigure the property to bring the building up to current codes and invigorate the living spaces while preserving the building's classic exterior. These plans include the addition of at least three new floors to the building, including co-living suites, a truly remarkable project. Lorca O'Herlihy, FAIA, is founder and principal of LOHA, Lorcan O'Herlihy Architects, which seeks opportunities to engage the ever-changing complexities of the urban landscape while embracing architecture as a catalyst for change. Since its inception in 1994, LOHA's urban and social concerns have been paired with an interest in artistry. Lorcan spent his formative years working in New York and Paris on the Grand Louvre Museum as a designer at IMP Partners. Lorcan has also worked as a painter, sculptor, and furniture maker. The methodologies of material exploration and formal inflection derived from the looseness of abstract art have played a significant role across all media and are a critical driver of his architecture. Lorcan's professional practice as an architect has been accompanied by his academic and intellectual pursuits. He received a Master of Arts in History and Critical Thinking from the Architectural Association in London, writing a dissertation on social connectivity and generative urban strategies. He's taught and lectured extensively over the last decade, including at the Architectural Association in London, Southern California Institute of Architecture, Cranbrook Academy of Art, Columbia University, Carnegie Mellon, Pratt Institute, and the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. He is currently an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California. In 2004, the Architectural League of New York selected Lorcan O'Herlihy as one of eight emerging voices in the United States. In 2009, Lorcan was elevated to the prestigious College of Fellows in the American Institute of Architects, an award to members who have made significant contributions to the profession. Lorcan's commitment to design excellence in commercial, educational, and residential projects has earned him over 90 national and local design awards, including the AIA California Council Distinguished Practice Award, AIA Los Angeles Firm of the Year Award, and in 2018, LOHA was awarded the status of the number one design firm in the United States, according to Architect Magazine's Architect 50. 
So without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Lorca Noherlihy and Richard Loring. Welcome, Lorcan and Richard, to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Enoch. Pleasure to be here. And Pleasure to be here. This is a very unique episode because I've never had an architect on the show with a client, let alone a client where there's been a long-lived relationship that's gone on as long as you, both of you to have been working together. How long has it been approximately? Not exactly, but how long have you <laughs> been working together? I say 30 years, Larkin says 20 years. Yes, I, 30 works for me. <laughs> okay. I believe 30 years ago was our first project together, absolutely. That's amazing. And can you tell me, how did that first project come about? What was it? What was the story behind that? Um, I'll jump in here, Richard. Uh, okay. I, uh, we were, uh, I think, Richard, your office was in uh, Marina del Rey or Santa Monica? Yeah, and uh, yeah, right. my yeah. right in my office in Venice, and I had a very small project. And one of my dreams was to work with uh, at that time. It was called Archetype, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, he, uh, Richard, you worked on some incredible projects back then, and you were kind enough to take on this elliptical addition to a house I was mm-hmm. doing. And uh, that was our first kind of foray uh, into the world of uh, architect uh, um, slash. That was a more of a contract pr- scenario. Uh, but it was our first time we reconnected. And then later on, uh, there was a gap. And then we started working together about 18 to 20 years ago on mm-hmm. our projects in West Hollywood, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. Richard. And uh, Gardner being our first one, which was a really interesting project. Uh, for me, I was excited because Richard had seen a project I'd done, a house for that matter, in Silver Lake. And it was hanging off of a hill. And it was called Alexa mm-hmm. McCarthy House. And he walked in my office one day and said, Lorcan, can we apply these ideas of a single home into a larger scale 10 unit housing project? And of course I said, yes. <laughs> and um, it he turned said, out to be very, he, he said yes without thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true because back then, which is, this also brings up an interesting point back then in the early 2000s, there was challenges with these type for sale uh, product uh, housing projects where there was concerns about liability and all that. And I was convinced with my relationship with Richard that that would never um, rear its ugly head. And it didn't, we built a great project. It was m- very celebrated and uh, it goes to show you produce good work, work with a great client. It's a win-win situation and you don't have to worry about all the other kind of pitfalls that one could have with uh, for sale products uh, like a housing project. So that, to me, that was a great start. And uh, you, uh, I'll let Richard jump in when you want. That led to two other very important projects in West Hollywood, uh, project next to the Schindler House. And then the third one being a red and orange building on Formosa <laughs> Avenue. Um, I think Richard finally uh, was willing to realize that our project were successful and uh tenant clients, uh, future clients liked our work. So we push it even further on, on Formosa, in my opinion. That was also with a pocket park built into a private land. Another really interesting story behind yeah. that one. Mm. Yeah. And we, but yeah, a lot. Yeah. It wasn't hard enough just doing a great piece of architecture. We had to do a pocket park too. <laughs> so. We Spice did. <laughs> and yeah, which what was interesting with that was, is that it was the social agency we brought to that project or social equity, meaning that as long as we could get our 11 units, tuck the parking underneath this park uh, and get what worked, uh, we can also give back to the community and have a pocket park that's accessible to the city. And that's a really interesting concept that you can build a public park, pocket park on private land. And that, that is a very be a really interesting precedent if cities started to address and, and embrace that idea, certainly within Los Angeles, where I've always held a position that uh, to go to see the mountains, you have to get in your car and drive, go to the beach, jump in your car, go to the beach. If you want to go to Griffith Park, uh, you have to get in your car and go there. Whereas if you have this approach where you have these pocket parks in a way splintered throughout the city, you could walk to it. So the concept that you can walk to a park, even though it's small, uh, really uh, makes uh, lends itself to having a much more accessible city. Oh, and this be, idea yeah. of and the greening of cities, I think, is essential. Certainly, this day and age, right now, natural air is crucial. Trees, all these aspects that pocket parks bring to the city, I see that continuing in a very robust way. Outdoor spaces are going to play a larger role in terms of. Uh, housing projects and 
uh, certainly uh, urban infill projects, whether they're commercial or residential. Take, take, and we did it. Take me back, so, if you would, to, to the early days. So you have a, both of you have a long, impressive career of, of achievements. And I would imagine when you start out, did the math, that's around 1990, when you did your first project mm -hmm. together around that time period. What, what was that like? What, what was it like to be Lorcan and Richard at that time? And how did you two come mm -hmm. together and pull off that project? Walk me through that. So, Richard, you take the lead here. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so um, first of all, my, my background's architectural. So, I, I went to the University of Michigan, got an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree in architecture, worked, you know, in the profession for about three years before I came out to California. And then when I came out to Cali, um, I started out wanting to do design-build projects. And, in fact, I did do design-build projects, but they – you know, were relatively small scale. Um, I, I was enjoying them, but I started to be noticed by the architectural community. Um, and so uh, architects started to call me to ask if I would uh, build their projects. And that was a very interesting prospect to me. Um, and so I, I got very involved with the architectural community here in LA, uh, building for you know, kind of a who's who of, of architects back in the back in the nineties. If and if I can interject, which I'm really interested, what what was it about uh, your you your buildings that you were doing that that attracted these other architects to want to work with you? Well, I was you know, look, the, the buildings that I was doing, even though they were design build, they were architectural. I'm not going to say that they were great architecture, but they were architectural, and you know, I think that architects that were watching me kind of understood that as a builder, uh, I, I understood what they were doing, <laughs> you know, very well. And, and I understood the intent behind things that were, that they were trying to do. And I, and I, so I think early on architects just recognized that, you know, I would be a, an easier contractor to work with because I actually understood what they were doing. They didn't have to take as much time explaining what they were trying to do or why a particular detail was important or an alignment was critical, you know, that, that type of thing. The, all the things that go into modernist architecture, the, the, those are things that, you know, not all builders are conversant with. And, and so I think that's how it started. And then, you know, once a couple architects discovered that I could, you know, work with them and make it uh, easier in, in some ways, um, they started, you, know, you get, you get passed around. <laughs> right. You get, right. You get passed around. So I got passed around. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, yeah, it was a wonderful experience for me personally, because when we jump scale, because early uh, careers of architects are you do houses and you do retail, small retail mm -hmm. and to jump into urban uh, uh, scenarios like uh, 10 to 20 unit buildings was a jump, which was exciting for me. I felt like it was a great opportunity because not only was I working with a developer like Richard, but he was also going to build it. And he also had a background in architecture. So in a sense, those first early projects with Richard, I have, I would love the opportunity to sit in, in a room and talk to not only the person who was going to be the client, but someone who was going to build it, meaning you learn quickly. <laughs> and also his background in architecture, his ability to recognize very subtle architectural gestures that were valuable. And what was great about working with you, Richard, was you would understand, okay, I, I get these three, uh, uh, let's try to make this work. And we we're solving problems. We weren't just, um, just uh, uh, you know, pushing one idea or the other. There were flexibility in the way I worked and Richard worked to be able to say, look, design is important. Design does sell. Design has value. Let's find a way to do it, but also make sure that if there's efficiency built into it. So it's about science and art. Can you bring artistry and also make sure that the science of building is also built in? So what better opportunity to work with a client who uh, recognizes both in a big way, being an architect uh, as by training and also not only building it, but also the client. And so I will always feel very fortunate with that. And uh that led to, uh, frankly, the work I'm doing now. And I always look back to those early years, and Richard knows this, and that was so essential to my growth as an, as an architect mm. to be able to now know, produce buildings, produce architecture, uh, and do good sets of drawings to know that it's built well, 
and also have that artistry to it uh, to be able to uplift people who are living there. And we do a lot of supportive housing as well. So we bring that ideas all the way from all, all socioeconomic levels. <clears throat> all good. Richard, it sounds like you've been able to make an emphasis on design work with your developments. And what is it do you think that, that keeps other developers from embracing that? Because this is a common struggle I hear is that architects feel like they're fighting against the developer who doesn't appreciate the architecture and the value of design. Um, well, I have a little longer view um, than I think you do um, because you're, you're so young. This and is true. And I'm, I'm not as young. And, <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that um, the receptivity now on the part of developers is much, much greater, mm-hmm. again, in comparison relative to what it was 20, 25, 30 years ago. Fascinating. You know? um, there were very few architects that I knew that I was friendly with back in the 90s that had opportunities to work with developers that are relatively... Uh, small scale, you know, the, the, these projects we do are relatively small scale. And um, I, I think there are a lot more opportunities now. I know that Lorcan uh, is a great example of that. He has um, a lot of uh, developers that he's working with all over the country. Uh, and those developers, you know, either didn't exist 25 years ago or they mm-hmm. wouldn't have thought to try to work with a, an architect doing contemporary uh, architecture. So I, I actually think it's changed quite a bit. And, and I think that the reason it's changed, I think there are two primary reasons. I think one of them Lorcan already alluded to is that uh, developers slowly but surely are starting to understand the value in good architecture. And I'm not just talking about the visual value. I'm talking about function. I'm talking about, you know, uh, amenities, things that, that, modern architecture can bring to a building or a series of buildings that more banal kinds of practitioners don't understand how to bring to, to a project. So I think that's a big, big part of it, that developers are starting to recognize the value of architecture. Um, and then the other thing I think is happening is that architects slowly but surely are starting to understand that if they want to work with developers, they got to allow the developer the opportunity to make money on a project because otherwise the developer can't continue doing these projects. And, and that's also a process. That's a process. You learn mm-hmm. how to do that. Yeah, you learn how to do right. that. Right. I always use this example, Richard, our, our project next to the Schindler House. Um, mm-hmm. I won't go into the politics of that and the challenges of producing that, but yeah. there was one design move we did, which in a sense talks about the value of design, but the value of design is a carved out open space, meaning those units had carved out outdoor spaces uh, and that brought light from di- three different sources. So uh, each one of those units on the top of the building and other parts had these cuts into it that brought natural light. And uh, so it was challenging for you, but you saw value in a sense, if it's a 1200 square foot unit, uh, can you sell a 1050 square, 1060 square foot unit with 400 square feet or maybe uh, 120 square feet, forgive me, uh, outdoor space? And you were able to do it. It turns you out were, the answer was yes. <laughs> yes, but, uh, but in a sense, you knew yeah. that if you wanted a 1200 unit, Square, 1200 square foot, you, you know that there was value in that as for sale housing project, but you thought if you cut back a thou- 100 square feet and have that 100 square feet as outdoor space, that brings such value that you can raise the bar on the, the selling of that because of the quality of that space. Yeah. And that uh, I felt that that was a really important move, and you were um, completely excited and recognized the value of that. At least that's my position. <laughs> but we did. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you did well yeah. on that building. So, yeah. I yeah. mean, what, uh, th- th- this is probably a good segue into a little, you know, kind of side conversation about the value. Um, we sold that project on Kings Road. There were 19 units and we were getting, you know, we're getting a very high price per square foot <laughs> on the sales, very high. And I was curious at the end of the process, I asked the realtor, I said, can you, you know, run a study, do a study and find out, you know, in our market, in our, 
local market, in West Hollywood, um, buildings like ours, you know, infill. Uh, how do we stack up price-wise, price per square foot, price per square foot? So they ran the, they ran the study, and, and they said, uh, how, many, how many units should we run? And I said, give me the top 20, right? We had 19 units. We had 19 of the top 20 prices per square foot. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's that's proof positive, uh, at least in the for sale market. That's proof positive. You you can't argue with those numbers. You know, nineteen out of twenty. Um, so we we proved, Lorcan and I proved that really exceptional architecture uh, commands a, a higher price than than you know everyday examples. And what about the funding? Was it difficult to get uh, to get bank funding or wherever you're getting your, your resources from when they look no. at the numbers and they say, wow, you're cutting out this much square feet and these are going to be priced too high? No. Was that an issue at all or was it? Uh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't tell the bank. Okay. <laughs> <We kept laughs> Fair the, enough. <laughs> we kept the secret. Look, we didn't, we didn't know uh, for sure, you know, what the sales numbers would look like. Yep. And <laughs> the, back in those days, the banks weren't as curious as they are about market fundamentals. Um, and so we managed to get the project built. I got the money raised that I needed to raise and it, you know, we crossed our fingers and it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> Lorcan, you, you mentioned the, the, you mentioned the idea about uh, the politics. You said, we're not going to go into the politics of how that project <laughs> came about. Right. But, but one thing I've heard just in our initial pre-conversation with both of you is that let's face it, the, the kind of work that you, both of you are doing and the locations and the projects, I'm sure there's so much more to the architecture to make this happen in terms of stakeholders, people with different agendas, bringing them together, maintaining design integrity. Do you have some stories, anecdotal stories that you could share that where you faced a challenge of that sort, you were able to come together and, and pull the project through? What, is it, what does it take? What does it really take to do this other than the glossy magazine pictures we see that are beautiful? Hmm. Boy, um, <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I could give a quick overview. It's been many years, so happy to talk about it. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll uh, give a specific instance after Lord gives yeah. a quick overview. Yeah, I mean, big picture without going in great detail, where Richard was uh, wise enough to purchase a piece of Lennox, the Schindler House. And uh, to Richard's credit, we, before we even went to the first step, met with all the stakeholders who would be affected by this project, meaning the Francis Schindler House and the Max Center, uh, we were always to get. We were always uh, had great support from the uh, from the city about producing this project, which was 19 units. One of the key issues we did was we dropped the building from 45 feet to 30 feet adjacent to the Schindler House. So no uh, shadows were cast on the Schindler House. Big move by Richard and collectively us from a from a kind of a massing idea that you could drop it. We pushed the density to the other end, meaning that we would never sh cast shadows on it. But even though we made the efforts, the good faith effort was made to really engage and to uh, discuss with uh, those who were involved with the project, they still from uh, uh, the Mac Center took the position that a uh, kind of an agile prop. Uh, scenario, which was, oh my God, it's a four-story building, going to destroy the spirit. And in the end, even though, you know, wink, wink, they knew we were actually dropping it 15 feet, they didn't want to acknowledge it. Mm. So that's the kind of challenges you have to deal with where it's what, how can we make this dramatic? How can we make this a larger story? In the end, it was built and uh, it's a successful project. The city was very happy with it. And I frankly think the friends of the Schiller House who own the Schiller House certainly were supportive of it. It was just the organization and a reputable organization that was renting it, uh, mm -hmm. it took issues. So that's an example of how do you hang in there and how do you uh, keep a uh, move forward? And Richard, you, <laughs> you certainly had to battle that in a big way, but I felt yeah. in the end, we were, we stuck together uh, and made it happen. And in the end it was a successful project. They actually organized uh, a, a resistance to our project, these Austrians. I bet and, you love uh, that. I bet that was fantastic to get that memo. Fantastic, <laughs> you know. And so they organized a competition. Oh, international, wow. International competition. Oh, wow. To envision what should go on my property. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. instead, of, instead of Lorcan's <laughs> design. And, mm -hmm. uh, 
And so they actually had a presentation of these outlandish, for the most part, nonsensical, you know, crazy ideas uh, in public forum one evening at the Schindler House. And I had to go, I didn't have to, but I was happy to go and defend Lorcan's approach to the project um, mm. in front of, and, and the architects over there were formidable. I mean, you know, Frank Gehry submitted something, I think, uh, Mark Mann. Not, not, not Frank, but um, not Frank. Zaha did. Zaha oh, Zaha did, yeah. A twenty-story building, a twenty-story okay. building, and, that's, <laughs> and the the twenty-story w- building won out. Oh wow! So, yeah, it wasn't really comparing apples to apples. It was comparing apples to oranges. Meaning, there yeah. needed to be a housing project. There were height restrictions, and there was all kinds of uh, criteria. <laughs> but when you have a when you have a competition, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You can make it whatever. Yeah. You can make it a uh, a twenty-story tower. You can do it an underground structure. The ones that were more favored are the ones that was underground. It's very difficult to have a housing project three stories underground, underground. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. underground. Or, or, so the one, so as you can see, it was comparing apples to oranges. But in the end, uh, I think we prevailed. <laughs> yeah. well, we did. You know, Eric Owen Moss showed up at this thing. You know, with with the usual his usual nonsense. That's what I consider it. Uh, it just outlandish stuff that could never in a million years be approved. First of all, it would never be, could never be approved by the city. Um, unbuildable from every aspect. And, it, you know, so that's an example of the kind of roadblocks and the kind of challenges that we had to deal with on that project. Um, yeah. Yeah. In a sense, it benefited us because, that's quite yeah. obviously a 20, 20 story building next to mm-hmm. a one story Schindler house would not exactly be the most ideal solution. Uh, and uh, so after that, I think it just dissipated mm. and realized, okay, let's produce great architecture and make this a really strong piece of architecture that has strategic uh, ideas to it that were about creating a great place to live. And that's what we did. So right. that's an example. Uh, Formosa was another one we did where, uh, as as we alluded to, uh, where they wanted us to keep this existing house that was falling apart and boarded up. And there was a crack house and they suggested putting it on the roof of the new building. Uh, So if you can well imagine how challenging that would be uh, to take a house and put it on a five story, uh, four story building and keep it intact. So uh, we were able to come up with a strategy to say, look, why don't we propose and you were familiar with the process, Richard, with the idea of pocket parks. And um, I was excited about it because I felt it talked a larger a story about us. Mm-hmm. C- cities should be. And that is, is can you take a private p- piece of land and if the developer is progressive enough to allow for a third of it to be given back to the city as a pocket park, as a public space mm-hmm. on private land. Mm-hmm. And uh, as uh, it, it was challenging for you, Richard, because it was like, uh, you were okay with it because it was like, okay, as long as we can get 11 units, we can get the parking in place. But frankly, it made for better units because those units were looking out at a pocket park as mm-hmm. opposed to another building 10 feet away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, it also benefited the city and benefited that street because the building on the other side of the pocket park had views of the park. And the building someday, uh, they don't take advantage of it now, but there's another building on the end of it, uh, which also would be able to have an opportunity to take advantage of looking at a park. Mm-hmm. And so what a great idea. Street, view, access for people, and then three other buildings looking out to a park. And all those units uh, are that much better. Mm-hmm. And yet we're able to solve the problem of getting the units because it's all driven by parking. And we had to make sure that we tuck the parking underneath the park and that's how we had the 11 units. Now, of course, knowing what I know now, I would have asked the city for more concessions. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which, 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 which would have been absolutely fair. You know, cities yes. should be doing things like this. But what they should absolutely. be doing, like, for instance, Enoch, I'll tell you what we got. We got our setbacks were slightly reduced, you know, incrementally reduced. We got an incremental increase in our oh, height, right? right? It should have been more, right? Mm, cities, agree. cities should yeah. be willing to to get amenities like this. They should be willing to allow developers higher density, you know, a higher building. You know, what's wrong with a building mm-hmm. that's a little higher than the others when you get a public park mm. as, as part of it? So 
I, you know, I would love to see a willingness on the part of city officials in LA to enter into those types of negotiations with developers. You know, other cities do it with some success, but it's harder. I think LA is one of the toughest places to do it because we have so much active nimbyism mm. in Los Angeles, you know, really active nimbyism that is not as present in some other cities. Um, right. You know, New York and Vancouver come to mind. <laughs> you know, no, I agree. places, places I agree. like Portland. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there's just more flexibility on the part of cities and part on the part of community groups. And there's more of a willingness to kind of work with architects and work with developers to come up with more creative solutions. And uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's a tougher thing to do in LA. Well, you were in a sense, we're ahead of the game, Richard, because they're finally getting there to a degree. They're starting to rethink their parking requirements mm-hmm. and they're starting to rethink heights. Yeah. Uh, there are now ample areas in Los Angeles where they're letting reliefing, kind of giving relief to that 45 to 55 mm-hmm. foot height. Uh, Los Angeles is always this kind of carpet of 55 feet or 45 foot tall buildings. And they had great concern about going above that uh, project we're doing uh, now, which is 11 stories. But we worked with the city to have 18 foot setbacks. In a sense, that's what we did on Formosa. We provided literally a 45 foot or 40 foot setback. Mm-hmm. And that should have allowed you to go to six stories or mm-hmm. seven if that matter, for that matter mm-hmm. and work with the parking. So you're absolutely right. There could have been flexibility in the city where they say, look, given that you're giving this park to the city, uh, wh- why don't we allow you height, um, a bit more reasonable height uh, tolerance and setback tolerances. And that's kind of a really interesting uh, premise. Now, Richard, you, you mentioned that there was a specific instance that you had come to mind in terms of this political give and take and, and getting things done. Mm-hmm. Was it already talked about or was there another? Well, the, the, the one at King's Road where they had this competition and then, mm. you know, I, I had to sit through this public presentation. Wow. That was that was the primary example. That was the one I was wow. thinking about most. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Lorcan, I'm, I'm curious – You've, you've been able to have a huge design impact in, in your design sense and even been awarded recently as the number one design firm in the U.S. by Architect Magazine. What what do you think it is has, that's been the key for you to resist the pressure of, or whatever it is, to be able to produce uh, designs of that caliber, of that quality throughout your career and get to where you are now? Uh, uh, it's a good point. Um, I, uh, it's just my nature, uh, my DNA for where I can't, uh, every single project we do is driven by ideas and design. I could not sl- sleep at night if I was working on a project that wasn't dealing with ideas. So mm-hmm. we start with that. Then it's this determination, I believe, to be able to find a solution based on the budget, based on all the criteria and all the kind of forces. Uh, and that's what is what drives it. Uh, and that's how it's been since the get go from the early days when I did houses and small retail all the way now to where we do much larger infrastructural institutional projects and work in Detroit, Raleigh to probably where we've got three projects, one completed in Detroit, two nearly completed. We have a project in Raleigh under construction and we're fortunate enough to have opportunities in other parts of the country to work. I think in a sense, uh, people recognize that, uh, that effort and that commitment. And in a way, I don't like to say obsession, but there is an aspect of that to just realize that, yes, you can find a way, a solution. Uh, one example is we work with a material uh, or uh, on certain of our projects where we found a great vendor, but we designed it and detailed it in such a way that it was half the price of other uh, uh, vendors in the same product. Uh, other ways that we deal with is uh, really recognizing uh, the value of uh, buildings having strategic openings in them, bringing in light. Those moves allow you to really, uh, in a way, mold a more interesting building. Buildings don't need to be a simple form. You could start with that, but you can start to cut into it and uh, modify from the conventional way of looking at a building. Our buildings in Detroit are all based on a step massing. Uh, there's a surrounding area is two story Victorian houses for that matter. And so we were able to use the forces of the adjacency adjacent buildings to kind of in a way uh, navigate the building and make sure it drops two story at one area and up to six stories in another. 
So those kind of moves make the project better. So you, you don't fight against it. You just embrace it and see how can that make your project better. I think that's why we're able to do it. It wasn't uh, something magical. It was just having an eye. Number one, you have to have a good eye as an architect. But also, uh, as I said earlier, see these forces as actually assets. And, uh, uh, and that, I think, goes a long way. If you mm. can respond to the uh, 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 culture of where you are and the context of where you are, it makes the project better. So it's, it, that's what draws all our, drives all our work. So it's not a magic bullet. It's being able to adjust accordingly where it is, driven by the site, driven by the context where it is, and then brainstorm with great clients. And you can't have a good project without a client like Richard yeah. and other clients. Uh, that's bottom line. You cannot produce this without having a, a great client. And that's what I have with Richard. So before you had the name I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it does. Sorry. And and, yeah. and people listening may think, oh, well, that's easy for Lorcan to say now mm-hmm. because, you know, they, they have all these awards. They have rain name recognition. They probably walk in the room and everyone wants to throw products at them. You might differ. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in the early days, what was it like in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, finding those ideal clients, finding those people that, that, appreciated what you were going to do on the project was a matter of you slipping in the pill of design or were these people that came to you already Um, with that mindset uh, my background and richard mentioned a bit about his background my background was that um i i studied in california in my undergrad i have a master's degree from the architectural association uh and i also worked uh some very interesting architects before i started my practice that being uh kevin roach john nico and associates being one uh, who's a wonderfully uh, won the Prixer Prize in 81. And then I was fortunate enough to join IMP Partners on the Louvre Museum. So I worked in the Louvre for three years. So I felt that from an early stage, I stuck to my kind of uh, uh, dreams of working with uh, uh, not only uh, exciting architects, but put myself in a position to learn. And I believe when I started my practice, I had... Uh, background having worked with Stephen Hall as well. I was an associate of Stephen Hall in the 80s. So the kind uh, that coupled with my own commitment to good design went a long way. So my first clients when I was a 26-year-old architect uh, were, were great, one of which my parents. I did a house for my parents, which is always the classic first project for an architect or a sparring architect. So I have to say that that uh, went a long way. Um, my parents' uh, house uh, got some recognition, architectural record, record houses. So right out of the bat, as the 26th architect, I was published. So I was very fortunate for that. But it all came down to ideas and design. So if you stick to that, in the end, you can find an avenue. Sometimes it's difficult because, uh, you know, you may not find the right client or a fine project that works for you. Uh, I didn't really have that problem because I didn't know how to do it any other way. I simply knew that design was an important component of it. So, and again, as I said, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm two thirds through. Uh, I'm no longer an aspiring architect. I'm definitely a seasoned architect. I'm not even a mid career, sadly. I'm getting to a point where I have to <laughs> recognize I've got to start, uh, keep producing. And uh, as an architect, you have to be patient. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but I've never second guessed the importance of design. So even when I had clients who would come to me with early on before the Richard time, uh, um, I would talk to them and ask them, what is it about this particular project that they like if it's more traditional project or more conventional? And I would find the kind of DNA of what they liked about it, but not the style. So I was able to take those ideas and apply it to more of a contemporary approach. So uh, that's what I've done. And they bought it. Uh, and they recognize there's value in that. So it's more about the ideas, about what they liked about a project as opposed to the particular style. So I never had that problem. No one ever came to me with a traditional <laughs> uh, building and said, I like this. Can you do that? I've never had that. Beautiful. I've always found find ways to get around it. What is it a, do you like about that? What are the aspects of it? Is it spatial quality? Is it materiality quality? And then I would reformulate that into a piece of architecture. So uh, that's worked for me to date. Uh, so um, that, I don't know if that answered your question. Well, thank you. And uh, let's talk about the product you're working on now together. Tell us about this. <laughs> you got to laugh first. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, okay. So I'm working now. Uh, 
consulting really for a development company out of Atlanta. And they decided to buy a 90 year old building in Hancock Park and do a co-living project. And I told them, I said, you know, it's gonna be tough, really tough. It's a, it's a challenging part of the city to work in. Uh, community groups are very active in, in this part of the city. Preservation groups are active. Um, it's an old building. You know, it's a 90 year old building uh, with a relatively checkered past. And, uh, but they were uh, determined uh, to, to, to do this. So they uh, purchased the building. And um, we had a uh, RFP, you know, we sent our RFP to a, a very select, very select group of architects. Um, of course, Lorcan was on the list because Lorcan's always on those types of lists. <laughs> and, um, you know, Lorcan uh, was awarded the, the contract. And so we've been now working for three months, um, really just doing conceptual and schematic design because the, it, it's a, it's a project that has so many different pressure points and complexities to it. Uh, you know, start out with the fact that, you know, we're trying to build, we're trying to expand the square footage of a building that's 90 years old. It's historic. It's not designated, but it's historic. And uh, early on, my one of the strategic decisions that I made was to uh, embrace the Secretary of the Interior's standards for historic preservation, just say, look, we're going to use the standards. We're going to work within those standards. And my thinking was that, uh, you know, if the preservation community decided to get involved in the project, we could then welcome them aboard instead of having to fight with them. Um, so, but, but again, doing that, it presents some real challenges because you, you're, you know, you're, you're overlaying a, a very large set of constraints on the architect and asking the architect to operate within those constraints and uh, not an easy thing to do. And I'm sure as Lorcan can, can, uh, uh, can attest to, uh, it, it took a while. There was, there was an evolution. You know, the first schemes that we were looking at, clearly, in, in retrospect, that's for sure, clearly would have been challenging uh, from a preservation standpoint. Now, we don't know that we're going to end up having to work with that community, but we may. And so this was a very kind of defensive posture, if you will. Um, uh, another thing that we uh, ha had to do is that we have neighbor, uh, forget about the preservationists, we have neighbors that probably don't care one way or another about preservation, but they care very much about development and they don't care about it in a friendly way. So we had to also be very concerned about, you know, massing, uh, height, you know, scale, shadow, you know, all of the ways that our building could affect a, a, a neighboring street or a neighboring building. So that's a whole different set of constraints uh, from the historic constraints. Uh, and then, of course, just to make it even more challenging, we said, well, Lork, you know, we're, we want to do a building that's partially co-living and the rest of it traditional apartments. So we ended up with about a 40, 60 mix, 40% of the square footage is co-living, 60% is uh, traditional. And again, co-living is a relatively new, um, you know, it's, it's a new flavor of the day. And you're, you're using different types of planning concepts when you do a co-living uh, project too. So that made it complicated. So I think you're getting the idea here. It's just layer upon layer upon layer of, of complications and impacts to a project. And, you know, my, uh, the guys that I work for uh, were somewhat nervous because at, initially we were moving pretty slowly through that part of the process. And I kept having to tell them, look, um, Lorcan will get this. He'll, he'll, he'll get us there. You guys, you guys just need to be patient. 
You need to let them work through these issues. Don't try and force it. You know, don't tell them what you want to see. Let him absorb the information and then give us what he envisions. And then we can, we can funnel down to the right project. And um, I'm now extremely confident that, that we've actually done that. You know, is it the project that any of us envisioned at the beginning? Probably not, you know. But I think it's going to be an amazing project. Um, and it will be respectful of the existing building. It'll be respectful of the standards, the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, it'll, it'll be successful on many, many different levels. Mm -hmm. I, I really uh, agree with you, Richard. We're in a good place. And again, it's a process. It's an evolution <laughs> how these come together. And I personally am very fascinated with these type of projects. Cities grow. Uh, incrementally, and they also uh, grow in such a way you have existing and new. Uh, and this is, in a way, a microcosm of that. You have this wonderful existing building, and you're going to build a new atop. How do you do that, and how do you do it well? But how do you respond to adjacencies? Uh, buildings behind it, buildings on the side. How do you recognize the importance for not having a, a significant kind of uh, uh, impact on the street? So all these variables lead to an interesting project. And uh, some of our work in Detroit is similar to this. We're doing a project called the Obama Building, where it's, uh, it's a historical building, and we're adding to it. So it's the same kind of variable. And Detroit is uh, all about that. And, and you've been, you're from there, Richard. You know that city well. Yeah. Uh, Los Angeles is starting to embrace these type of buildings, but also recognizing we need to somehow um, go forward as well with these buildings. And that's the value of this particular project. I'm, I'm going to bring up something else that just occurred to me, um, Enoch, that I think is important. Um, one of the things that Lorcan brings to the table is that resident, I, I, I've had to interact with a lot of re resident groups, tenant groups, resident groups, neighborhood groups. And one of the things that's been wonderful is that even these folks who are definitely definitely not trained in architecture and don't have any inherent interest in contemporary architecture, uh, they recognize good architecture when they see it, which, which I think is, is fascinating. And uh, my con consistent experience with Lorcan has been that when I go to a community group and I present the project, um, they're excited by it. They may not understand you know, what Lorcan's been up to. They may not understand that the, the use of color that, that we decided on in a particular project. They may have a lot of questions, but they recognize that, that they recognize that what they're seeing is exceptional. And that's been a, a very consistent theme on all of the pro all the projects that I've done with Lorcan that have been development projects. Even when I haven't been the developer, we've had a couple of projects that we worked on together. Like Amazing. That. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's been that's been really gratifying to see people with no background in architecture look at these projects and go, my God, this, this is really cool. It's wonderful to look at. It's wonderful to experience. Yeah. What, what would you two say would be the, the, the key ingredients for a great back and forth relationship between <sighs> developer and architect? Mm hmm. Well, I know what my answer would be, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say being a good listener and mm -hmm. recognize what's uh, key to who you're working with because that's essential and uh, a successful project has to have that aspect to it and listening is very important to me and because i'm confident that from a design standpoint i can get feedback and be able to come back uh with a strong piece of architecture and mm -hmm. so listening and being a good listener Lord, and when you say listening help me understand what do you mean by listening uh, if there are forces that are beyond what I'm involved with, if, if a client has different uh, uh, constraints, whether it's budgetary or it's being responding, uh, this particular project we're working on right now, there are multiple forces. And when Richard has a feedback about what we're doing, I know it's coming from a place where we'll start to uh, have an impact later on. So we need to address it now and being able to hear that as opposed to taking the position that there's only one solution, this is it, nothing else can work. And I think that's a key to the success we've had. And uh, as I said, architecture is complex, but there are many ways that one can resolve. You just have to be able to 
understand that when you're working collaboratively with a client, uh, when they come to the table with a with a feedback from you, that it's coming from a, a place that you need to listen to. Mm. And we can always find a way to be able to, uh, if one has a good eye, to fold that into the project and uh, then the client sees that you're listening. That's really important. You just have to have that ability to do that. And that's what I feel is essential. Uh, other than that is uh, what's also key is, is um, in a sense, recognizing the forces in these projects, as Richard said early on, that they have to make profit on certain projects, and uh, and and you not admit you have to make sure that it has to be a win-win situation collectively, not just from an architectural standpoint, but from a budgetary standpoint, and also from a, uh, a scheduling standpoint. All these play a big role, and that's something that I've never feared. I never had an issue with that. I think that makes projects more interesting if you choose to see it as being an asset, and I do. So I don't know if that makes sense, answers your Got question. It. So, Richard, your turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Enoch, uh, you know, Workin mentioned being a good listener. You asked them what that meant. And, you know, it, it, it ties back in and probably is, is synonymous with what I was saying before. Lorkin's flexible. You know, he does not believe that there's one design solution to any particular project. And so the ability on his part to listen, which is his word of choice, to listen and then respond in a flexible manner is to me the, the, the secret sauce. Plus is just talent. Let's not forget there's just talent. Let's, we shouldn't forget that, right, Lord? <laughs> you know, because you know, uh, uh, an, yeah. architect, an architect can be a good listener but have no talent. You know, yeah, you uh, need to have a good eye. You're not going to get a great have... project. <laughs> so, yeah. so you need that flexibility. You, you know, you need to you need to be a listener, and then from, I think when I'm trying to look at it from an architect's standpoint, as an architect, what I would pray for, in in any client, not just a developer, but any client, is to have an appreciation for architecture as one of the great art forms, one of the great art forms, um, and yeah. to study it and and to think about it. You know, people go to a museum, they try and think about the paintings that they're going to go to see. They try and learn about the, the style of painting or the era or the particular artist. And I think that people that are working with architects need to make the same effort. They need to try to educate themselves so that they come to the table uh, knowing something about what the architect is trying to do. So I would say from the architect's standpoint, that's what I would always pray for. I would pray for the, the client that actually is interested in, in architecture. Mm. Right. You, you said a good point about you need to have, you used the term talent. I, I always use the term, you have to have a good eye as an architect, meaning that as you get these constraints that uh, one has to be able to, as an architect, visualize, because nothing exists, but visualize that that can work. And that's mm -hmm. the key. Uh, and that's what I, my goal is when we have meetings is to say, okay, it's moving being this way, I can see how that could work. And mm -hmm. so that is something that uh, is, is uh, very important to me. Uh, I've always held the position that architecture is about uh, if people, if you can do a piece of architecture and build it, and that makes people hesitate to stop, pull over and look at it and say, this is interesting. That's a very important uh, component of how cities grow in a really good way. You have to create architecture in cities that uh, are, are uplifting and great art and, and, one can imagine it being uh, a future kind of uh, strategy mm. for cities. If you can produce good architecture, you don't want to live in the past. You need to move forward, but you don't deny history. You don't deny what's there. What you do is you engage it, but you push it forward. And that to me is what's good architecture is certainly within ur uh, urban culture and urban mm. cities. And that, all our work is in cities. <laughs> well, yeah. that, that's a great segue into my last question. We can wrap it up for today, which is mm -hmm. where do you see cities and buildings going optimistically? If you could influence them, which you are, where, where, what do you think the possibilities are for the future? Uh, I think that, again, I'll just throw out a few comments. I, uh, uh, there is a social uh, agenda and social agency that needs to be applied to cities and people have to, you have to bring that value to cities. It's not simply about these autonomous objects or objects that are uh, turning us back from the city. You need to engage. 
And uh, I think given right now, uh, our work has always been about that. And in this particular challenging time we have right now, I see it's a continuation of what we've been doing for 20 years. And that is to really produce architecture where you have great spaces, where you have access to exterior, where you have all those components. And that bring that leads to a livable city. That's where we're going. It has to. I think this is just going to be, in a way, jump started in starting it in a, in a very important way. It's something we've done or I've done for many years, and Richard's been involved with that. Look at all of our work, pocket parks, carved out open spaces and building, even the other ones uh, that we work together. Uh, they've all had those aspects of it. So I do think that cities have to continue that way. And the role of an architect is to do that, to really understand the forces and, and see it as, as critical to future cities. You have to engage. Buildings don't stop. I use the term amplified urbanism, meaning when you produce projects, it has to engage the sidewalk and street and adjacencies. You can't simply uh, do a building, plop it there, and don't recognize how important it is, how it's going to affect the city. You have to look at not only in terms of the adjacency, but beyond that. How is your building going to affect uh, the commerce that's two to three, store, uh, th three, two to three blocks away? Is what you're doing going to benefit that? The project we're doing in, in Detroit is similar to that. It's a uh, it's a co-living project in, in Detroit, and there is Wayne State University, and there's a Motown, there's a variety of different areas around it. So we're designing the building, but programmatically bringing uh, opportunities for all those people who are uh, working in those areas and studying in universities to live in this so that it starts to act as a uh, catalyst for change around it. That's what I think architecture is going to be. It's about social agency. It's about engaging the city. <clears throat> Richard, from your side. <laughs> um, look, uh, people people are uh, talking about the end of uh, <clears throat> cities as we know them. I, I don't buy it at all, mm. not even a little. I think people are very caught up in the moment, uh, understandably. Mm. But I think uh, cities are here to stay. I mean, I think the, you know, as, as Lorcan has, has um, uh, talked about, you know, I think architects, their job is to make cities more um, humane and to, within a, within the environment of a city, to kind of nurture the human spirit. You know, it's important. It's an important function. And I think that architects will continue to, to try to do these things. And I think cities will continue to, to grow. And I, I am hoping that, uh, that all cities you know, not just Los Angeles, but all cities figure out a way to make uh, housing more affordable. I think the, the, the one of the biggest issues of our time is housing affordability. And that's an issue that's, that people all over the world are struggling with. And I think architects have a primary role to play, not the only role, but the primary role to play in helping, you know, kind of lead us forward in that in that search so that's what i would say wonderful agreed yeah agreed. amazing architecture has to be available for all socioeconomic levels yep. completely 100 yep. percent great great optimistic note to to uh to leave on today and uh thank you gentlemen both of you for your right. time look lorca no hurley thank you for your time and and richard oh, sure. richard loring yeah. thank you for joining yeah. us on the business yeah. of architecture and that's a wrap Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Today's episode is also sponsored by Layer App. Layer App takes all of your project related data, photos, and files and makes them accessible with the click of a button right in Revit. So, let me tell you how this works. It took me a while to get the concept. Uh, say that you go to a job site and you take a bunch of pictures. Now, you get back to the office with your camera loaded down with hundreds, perhaps even thousands of pictures. 
and now it's your job to organize them in a way that makes sense so you and other team members can easily find and use them later. What a nightmare. Now, imagine instead that instead of wrestling with categorizing photos and renaming them and trying to organize them in folders, that the moment you took the photos on your smartphone, they were immediately linked to your Revit model where you or other team members could access them with the click of a button. This is what Layer App does. You can also link other project data like spec sheets, project notes, and anything else to elements right within Revit. So here are two reasons why I thought, as a listener, you'd want to try out Layer App. Number one, if you currently work for a firm, the last thing you want to be working on is tedious work like categorizing and organizing project information. If you're a firm owner or principal, your firm could save thousands in staff time just by using this app, not to mention the convenience of having project data at your fingertips right when you need it. I hope this is a valuable resource for you. If you use Revit, Layer App is a must-have. Find out more and get a completely free 14-day trial at layer.team forward slash BOA. It's layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot T-E-A-M forward slash BOA. And by the way, if you listen to episode 338, you can hear my interview with Zach Soflin, the founder and CEO of Layer App, the architect turned software developer who created the product. And get your free trial at layer.team forward slash BOA. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.